Welcome to the Navit Gaming Podcast, where it is our mission to explore the business and future of video games. We bring together the industry's brightest builders, investors, and thinkers to keep a pulse on current events, dissect emerging trends and games, share lessons learned, and have a great time. This podcast is also part of Novik's growing ecosystem, which ranges from free and premium research to consulting and advisory services. For more information, visit www.novik.co. This episode is brought to you by Pragma. Pragma is a back-end game engine founded by the engineering leaders who built the platforms for some of the largest live service games, including League of Legends, Fortnite, Destiny 2, and Plants vs. Zombies 2. Pragma powers services like accounts, matchmaking, and player data for the world's most ambitious live service games. The Pragma backend game engine is the only solution that is truly extensible so that game designers aren't blocked by clumsy black box designs. With Pragma, studios no longer need to hire a large backend team and get the ultimate peace of mind that their game will always be ready to scale. To learn more, simply head to pragma.gg or check out the link in the show notes. And with that, let's jump into the episode. So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm your host Manu and it's raining here in Cologne today, which means it's a good time to have a great conversation. And that's exactly what we're here to do because today uh, we have a special guest joining us, Adam Lieb. He is the CEO of GameSight, which is a marketing technology company that provides a suite of tools to maximize performance marketing effectiveness across PC, console and Web3. So welcome, Adam. Thanks for having me. So to kick things off and, you know, for our listeners who might not be very familiar with you and GameSight, uh, could you give us a brief overview of your background uh, and also what GameSight is all about? Sure. Uh, so yeah, I've been, I'd say, in in and around games for 20 some odd years, which is basically my entire conscious life. Uh, I started my first gaming website when I was 11, doing basically re- reviews and, and walkthroughs of, of games. Uh, that little website got bought by IGN when I was like 14, and I've basically worked in games ever since. So um yeah, games is my entire life. I've spent the last 10 years building um, you know, this company now, which is GameSight. And uh, you know, GameSight, we connect players to their next favorite game. Uh, we do that by building a market-leading measurement platform that helps game publishers uh, around the world make the right marketing decisions. Um, and we, through sort of that process, have, have developed other really interesting technologies and platforms to help uh, games grow, including our uh, massive sort of influencer platform, which is used by hundreds of companies to, to execute you know, content creator uh, activations, everything from creator programs to sponsored campaigns to earned and organic stuff. So um, yeah, really anything we can do to help our, our PC and console game customers grow. Uh, the, the core of the business, as you sort of mentioned, is, is this measurement uh, attribution platform uh, that we pioneered, which is meant to help connect what happens out of the game with what happens in the game. Uh, so all marketing, digital marketing activities with all in-game activities from you know sales to in-game purchases and, and everything in between. I um, mean, so through that, we just have this sort of, I guess, really unique and interesting lens into how games work, how games launch, how games grow. And yeah, hopefully, you know, excited to chat today about some things that I've learned and many years doing this. Awesome, awesome. Uh, which uh, website was that, by the way? What was it called? Uh, <laughs> it was very, very, very creative, very creatively named in, in 64 guidescom So it was, uh, okay. I, I <laughs> nice. had many, many other websites that all followed the same rough pattern of the most obvious name <laughs> you could think of for the thing, which, you know, I was a kid, I guess it made sense to me. Yep, yep. Sometimes simplicity is the best. You know, know, it's good for SEO, (laughs) which didn't even really exist at the time, but, you know, functionally was still a thing. (laughs) Cool. Great, great. Great. So with that, I guess uh, we can kind of dive into today's uh, topic of discussion. Um, It's titled uh, S-Tier Go-To-Market Insights for PC Games. And I'd like to give a quick shout out to Nicole Yang, who's the CMO of GameSight, uh, for the awesome title. Uh, Now, this is a topic that 
I've been getting very curious about of late, especially since I see, you know, both new mobile games building cross-platform from the get-go and many existing mobile games uh, starting to launch their PC SKUs. Most recently, um, you know, we kind of saw Supercell also launch uh, Clash of Clans and Clash Royale uh, on PC. In short, uh, the need to understand how the PC platform behaves from a go-to-market perspective is becoming increasingly important for developers across gaming verticals. And that's why we have Adam here today. So let's kind of start off with laying a foundation for the discussion. Um, <clears throat> so Adam, when, when you know, kind of thinking about building a go-to-market strategy for, for a PC title from scratch, how should one structure their thoughts? You know, what what are the activity buckets one should be thinking about? Yeah, great. I guess sort of foundational question. I think the first the first step is is usually starting with the you know the goal, the outcome in mind, and I think that's really important in this context because there is no right answer and there is such a wide spectrum of answers. So, you know, I know PC consoles, uh, whatever, roughly $80 billion market, the, the difference between what's probably going to work for you know, Clash Royale, you know, popular mobile game now on PC, uh, free, to, free to play, you know, relatively low LTV, certainly in the PC console context, is going to be massively different than what Elden Ring uh you know, whatever, 60 plus dollar premium skew, one-time purchase, possibly with DLC type of game is is going to be looking for. And so, you know, kind of thinking about, yeah, what are, what are the goals? And I think for many of our customers and many PC console games, they sell premium products, right? They're trying to sell a game, like I said, once, maybe there's DLC, maybe there's some, some sort of like longer term service to the game, but the primary goal is still going to be sales in 30, 60, 90 days. Um, that is just such a different set of tactics one should take than launching a free-to-play service game that you expect or hope lasts for 10 years, right? You're, the way you think about optimization, the way you think about you know the efficacy of channels is just super, super different than, hey, can I make this one thing work for me today versus, hey, I need this thing to work for me for the next 10 years. So I think Starting with okay, well, what what, what like kind of world are we in? And, and there's a some gradation. There's definitely companies, um, and I actually think it's probably becoming the the most common type of game that we see is a premium product up front. There's still some sort of upfront cost, 20, 40, 60, 80 bucks, uh, with then some kind of live service component of either DLC, seasons pass, maybe microtransactions. Although that's probably the rarest one. Um, so I think that. You know, kind of figuring out where, where you are there is the first step. Um, and then once you do that, then all of a sudden, the, you know, a lot of the, the channel strategies, what you sort of called activity buckets, uh, you know, start to come more into place. There are some channels that are going to, you know, likely make more sense for one type of game than others. So I don't know. Linear TV, not the most common tactic, but if you're making a AAA first person shooter, you know, making Call of Duty, linear TV is almost certainly going to be a part of your GTM strategy. Uh, not the case if you're, you know, at a scopely and you're you're start you're taking stumble guys from mobile to to PC. Probably not doing linear TV commercials, although maybe they are. So if if they are, it's not my fault. <laughs> um, so I think that there's some of those channels that that are going to kind of be di- are going to dictate based on what type of game you are, and like I say, that kind of outcome you're you're looking for, and then once you kind of get into those those channels, so. You know, social, search, VOD, streaming, influencer, CTV, you know, these kind of like broad buckets of marketing activities. Uh, the tactics within each channel are also going to like range wildly, right? What, what you're going to do on, um, you know, I don't know, Reddit, for example, if you're, if you're in that like, hey, I need to push sales in 30, 60, 90 days is going to look different. There's going to be way more spend upfront. Um, before the game's launched, there's going to be more efforts around uh, wish list campaigns, pre-orders, uh, you know, really sort of building the the hype and hopefully inevitability of this game before it comes out. Where again, you're in the free to play service space, we're probably not doing that. Probably not spending money until people can download and play and spend in the game. Um, so the the tactics within each channel are, are going to be different. But I think the channels are, you know, they're broadly the same. You know, there's the, you know, all the ones I mentioned, social search, video, et cetera. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that there are, 
making sure that those things are clear. And I think sometimes, obviously everyone knows the type of game they're making, but I think sometimes there is a little bit of, um, you know, all games are like, you know, hey, this these are strategies that are working for games, but well, not all games are created equal and trying to figure out what what's going to work for your, not just business model, but but type of game in genre. And that's where I think we see the biggest changes in efficacy when we'll see two games with maybe the same marketing budget on one channel and one works really well and one doesn't. Well, sure, you know, there's things like creative and targeting and those things that, of course, matter. Um, but oftentimes it's it's the type of game. There's There are certain types of games that work really well on Reddit and there's types of games that don't work super well on Reddit. Uh, same thing with Twitch and same thing with YouTube. Uh, so starting to figure out on a per genre, you know, what type of game you're making basis, uh, make is what's going to probably make the difference between which channels are effective and which ones aren't. All right. Makes sense. So, so to quickly recap, it kind of sounds like a three-step process. So goals, but heavily kind of contextualized to, you know, what, uh, what genre of game uh, you're, you're building. Uh, then there's the channel strategies uh, themselves since, uh, yeah, there are a multitude of channels. Uh, each of them function differently and each of them might not contextually be relevant for you or the game you're building. And finally, once the strategies are set, you know, getting deeper into kind of the channel tactics. Um, great. All that makes sense. Um, before like kind of peeling a few more layers, uh, I'd like to ask maybe one more baseline setting question. Would you roughly say that, you know, PC game marketing is mostly split into performance brand and influencer marketing? Um, and if yes, like, could you quickly go over like, okay, what each kind of entails? Yeah, I think I would I would probably make a slight tweak to that. I think there are performance, brand, and like PR and comms. And then okay. I would put influencer if I were like drawing it, right? Then I would sort of put influencer in this this you know bar below it or above it that, that can touch all three. Uh, because I, I think, you know, I guess, so I'll talk about that in a minute. So I, those are the three that I would say is performance, brand, uh, P, PR and comms. And then, yeah, any influencer work is probably going to fall into one of those three buckets and they could be really, really different, right? You know, celebrity strategy, which, you know, kind of falls into influencer. That's going to be a PR comms thing. That's not a performance marketing thing. Uh, big sort of hype launch where maybe, you know, there's a, a commercial or a trailer and it features, features an influencer. That, that's a, that's a brand thing, right? That's not a, it's not a performance thing. And then you have well, we would generally call like blocking and tackling, but that's like, you know, sponsored content. Are streamers streaming my game? Is there TikTok videos for my game? Are there YouTube videos for my game that the creators, influencers have made that I've you know, sponsored them, given them free keys, et cetera, to do that I can measure to sales that that's performance. So I think that it, influence marketing can fit into all three, but they're, they're all kind of different tactics. Yeah, that's a, that's a good breakdown. Um, we will be kind of hitting on uh, Brandon, um, and the PR and comms bucket uh, a little bit later uh, and influencer marketing too. Uh, but maybe for now, uh, Adam, if you could just go uh, peel a few more layers into the performance marketing bucket um, and, you know, what what exactly does that entail in, in the PC games world? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because we, we really got started out. I would say there was roughly not a performance marketing industry in PC and console games. Like that was sort of like the dominion of, of mobile. Uh, you know, mobile, I think, you know, performance marketing was more native to mobile because, you know, A, games were free to play, you know, so like no barrier to download other than, you know, clicking clicking a couple buttons. Um, and B, the, the efficacy around tracking and ability to do tracking was like super high, right? IDFA, before that, it was it's called something else, but basically you knew for each player that, you know, click this button, that they downloaded your game and how much that cost you. That was I mean, that was sort of like a, a new concept in games where PC console is a little different in that the vast majority of games are distributed through third-party platforms, at least third-party to you as a, as a game developer. That's you know, Steam, Xbox, and you know, Nintendo, PlayStation, the, all of those storefronts. Uh, you know, in some ways, obfuscate your relationship. In most ways, obfuscate your relationship with your your customer, and you don't have that that sort of data. So I mean, that was like really like the core founding premise of our business was to solve that problem. What I would say most of our customers in those days, and people still to some extent do call it like the black box of Steam, which is I might spend my marketing dollars to send people to a Steam page for my game. They go there and I don't know what happens. Well, you know, GameSite solves that problem by connecting those dots with where, when the players actually download, play, buy, et cetera, in the game. So 
you know, performance marketing really is, you know, is that simple is, is it's marketing that you're able to connect to sales and to, to revenue. Uh, that is still a, a newer practice. I think when you look at the, the channels, like the ad networks that are available for PC and console game developers, they're, well, many of them are the same as they are in mobile. They don't work the same. So, you know, Facebook, for example, like Facebook for most PC and console developers for a really long time was not really a performance channel. It really was a, a brand channel. Like they, they, there was just, you know, what is my CPM and what audience am I reaching? There was not a, what is my cost per install or, or cost per sale? That's something that is that is changing now, and there is a building more of a practice around it. But I think it really is that you know the idea of using data and numbers to make decisions about exactly where you spend your marketing budget, not just basing it on uh, you know, eyeballs and views and things that are maybe measurable but not really performance. Cool. Yeah, uh, we can actually like maybe peel one more layer into the performance marketing side. And, you know, this is kind of moving more into the recent times. So and you kind of mentioned it in the previous answer. So we know, you know, Apple's uh, step towards increased privacy and more specifically the rolling out of ATT and IDFA. It has wreaked quite a lot of havoc uh, across the mobile free to play space. But you know, PC games also kind of market on mobile specific channels, um, like you explained previously. But yeah, has has one one discussion that doesn't often occur in the industry is okay how the IDFA has maybe impacted the PC uh, gaming space uh, spe- specifically and also console. But you know, this is a PC gaming um, or a PC games focused episode. So, so yeah, I guess my question is, you know, has IDFA uh, impacted PC performance marketing efforts at all, and by how much? Uh, and also, are developers kind of doing anything specific to combat against it? Uh, I think I think the the answer is a little. The answer is it has affected it a little. So the the core idea phase don't exist or you don't have access to them doesn't matter to PC developers. Like it just they they don't the IDFA is not part of the measurement process. You can get an IDFA from every phone or not every phone, but you don't have that when people download the game on Steam. So that actual idea thing doesn't matter like it, it is not used you know we do attribution it is not used it's never been used uh, for attribution for PC games I think where so you know directly no impact I think the indirect impact is channels like specifically Facebook's probably the best one their ability to target optimize do all the sort of like you know what I'll call it like black box magic that Facebook is really good at it's gotten worse, right? They they have you know, players that are opted out that they're no longer getting that data for and so you know, the same dollar spent on Facebook today is marginally worse than it was you know, whatever a year and a half ago because of the sort of like downstream impacts. Um, so I, I, we we have seen that we have seen channel efficacy change over time. Though some of those impacts have been negative, and then, and I think directly attributable to um, IDFA deprecation. Um, so you know. No, it hasn't. It hasn't impacted sort of the ability to do measurement, but it's impacted the efficacy of, of channels. Um, I would say the biggest change that, that we have seen, and, and you sort of alluded to it already, is more mobile first, maybe mobile exclusive game developers looking for other ways to grow, right. saying like, "Geez, the things we are doing no, either no longer work, don't work as well, um, or or maybe we're scared that they really will eventually never not work at all." And so. Uh, there's been more expansion to you know, other channels, PC being probably the first most logical one. It, it's probably technically the easiest to get a game that runs on a phone to run on a PC. Uh, so we've seen, you know, I bucket those into a, a couple different groups. I think the first is just straight ports where you have a mobile game and you port it to PC and it's the same game and it plays the same way. Uh, I think that is fine, but there's really yet to be an impactful game like that. Um, you know, I think it's gone the other way, where Fortnite was a, you know, there's other games too, but Fortnite probably being the biggest successful PC game that is a straight port uh, to mobile that has been a successful mobile game, you know, sort of their ability to distribute on certain platforms notwithstanding, uh, that that hasn't happened in, you know, I don't know, I probably don't expect it to happen. Games that are fun to play on your phone are typically not overly fun to play on your your PC. I think the games that have worked kind of well have been, and we'll see, you know, the, the, the Clash games just launched this week. Um, but those are games where the PC is more or less an extension. If you are a 
heavy and um, as someone who fits into that bucket I, re- I used to play clash of clans through an emulator on my pc because i wanted it on a bigger screen and i wanted to be able to have a little more control with the mouse so i totally understand that uh, but i still think that's a, a pretty s- a small subset so i think that's kind of like one bucket I think the next bucket which we're also seeing is is mobile the big big mobile publishers acquiring studios or building net new games that are PC first. Um, I think the probably most successful ones I can think of would be like NetEase, uh, you know, Naraka, Bladepoint, you know, massively successful PC game uh, you know, studio they acquired to, to, to build that. Um, and then I think they have uh, really good mobile, you know, sort of user acquisition strategies and live ops uh, abilities. And so they're sort of applying that to to a PC game. So I think we've seen some of that. And then I think the last bucket is the the hardest, uh, which is we call it like true cross-platform, cross-play. You know, it's a game like Fortnite. Uh, again, really hard to execute. There have been very, very, very few examples of, of people doing that where you build a game that is truly fun to play on any device and you know easily accessible on any device and then you can play with the same the same people across device so th- those are the kind of three buckets i see from this kind of like you know mobile moving more towards pc land and i i think just timing and our customer growth from that segment has been perfectly timed with idfa deprecation so i can draw a fairly rational conclusion that that's the reason it's happening Got it, got it. Yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I also really like the way you bucketed it. So yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, actually, let's move on from performance marketing and maybe touch on uh, brand and uh, influencer and you know the PR comms bucket uh, that you called out. So where are kind of these fields uh, today for PC games? And also, you know, more f- uh, looking forward, where where do you think they're kind of headed? Yeah, well, I think brand is really sophisticated in in PC gaming, right? It's it's a thing that they've been doing for a really long time, uh, mostly by necessity, or like mostly mostly by like kind of the nature of the way games have been developed, released, like physically sold in stores. Like the, like there are the constraints of sort of the way the industry was built. You know, you just have to buy discs, and then you've got CDs, and you know, fine, we don't. Maybe some people buy CDs, but you know most people buy digitally now. But there still is that inertia of this sort of big launch and release thing that has necessitated you know brand marketing, where like you know performance marketing, you know whether it was technically possible or not, wasn't used and wouldn't have really made sense 15 years ago um, in in the sort of like PC world. You know, and it does now, but the, the again like the quality of brand marketing is is so high, and I think you know up there with like luxury goods in the world for, for types of companies that are great at brand marketing. So um, that's still a huge piece of the industry. I think it's fairly sophisticated, uh, but it is also not wildly data-driven and certainly not not measured. I think that is something that has started to change really recently. Uh, market cycles, I think, have, have kind of dictated that. And I mean, that's a thing across all industries that, you know, the markets tighten up while brand marketing spins also tighten up. There's more scrutiny around, you know, how many billboards in Times Square did we really need and things like that. So um, we are starting to see more and more customers ask us for measurement around what are like very clearly traditional brand marketing strategies that not that you can't measure, but they're not you know, the the sphere in Las Vegas for $600,000 an hour is probably not going to math out to a positive ROI for like your game launch. Cool. And, you know, brand awareness and how many, you know, impressions they tell you you get or whatever. Like, I mean, I'm not to say that those things are, are not worth something, but you can't really measure that in a, in a performance marketing fashion. Uh, but we have had that request. So I don't know, maybe one day we'll, fi- one day we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think brand marketing for PC game, super sophisticated, uh, you know, super well, you know, all the things like that sphere, like I, I drove past it in Vegas many times as they were building it. And I was like, how many game ads are going to be on here when it launches? And like virtually everything I've seen has been a game ad. So like I was, you could just tell that's like what it was built for. Uh, so yeah, I think, you know, that, that's kind of the, the state of, of brand marketing. And, you know, I don't, I think the future is it will continue to get maybe a little more data driven, a little more, um, you know, a little more science to, to the art, but it's already really good and really effective. And, you know, I see, you do see stuff all the time where you're like, wow, that is really cool. And you paid attention and you remember it and kind of all the things that, that you want from brand marketing, you know, awareness, recall, you know, brand sentiment, like 
you know, just as a casual observer of that stuff, I see it all the time. Like, hmm, yeah, that was pretty, that was good marketing. That was cool. Makes sense. Uh, in, influencer marketing, I think is a, l- a little different place. Um, the, the way that I would frame it is if, if you use this sort of crawl, walk, run paradigm, I think, you know, games were really early into influencer marketing, right? Twitch, you know, sort of popped up and you have lots of people streaming video games. It was very clear that this was like good for your game and figuring out, okay, well now what do we do? How do we engage with those, those content creators? How do we you know, get more of them? How do we get more people making videos on YouTube for a game? Those are all things that I think gaming was just way earlier on than almost any other industry, just by the nature of video games are digital. And when people had access to these tools like YouTube and Twitch, they made game content. So, um, Games was early and, and sort of like ahead, but I think the the sophistication, you know, it's still a new ish medium. Um, I think I think we're sort of we've emerged from the the crawl area into a, a place where I would say most games are aware that content creators are a hugely important part of the games ecosystem. I think it's really rare that you see someone, you know, a, a sophisticated game studio making a game where they're not are they're not thinking about the game design with that in mind, like. Not just is this game fun to play, but is it fun to watch? And not that every game is going to be you know, built to be on the front page of Twitch, but I, I think that that is now part of the game development process is thinking about that. How do we make the game streamable? How do we have uh, highlight moments that are you know great for bite-sized chunks on YouTube shorts or, or TikTok? These are just now part of, of thinking about, about building a game. And then certainly when it comes to, to, to GTM, I don't think you see a game launch uh, with you know any sophisticated marketer that doesn't have an influencer strategy that isn't you know kind of key to the game's launch. How big a part of the budget is going to be, you know, of course, dictated by the specific game and the, the type of game and all that. But but that is it. it, it Ten years ago, you had maybe ten to twenty percent of games that even thought about content creators, and maybe their games were still being streamed on Twitch, but that, that they didn't care. It just happened or it didn't. That's like totally inverse now. It's probably ninety percent that are actively thinking about it. So I think they're sort of in that kind of walk place, and then you know the top ten to fifteen percent maybe of studios are are in what I would consider like the sort of run space, which is. Mm-hmm. Influencer marketing is no longer like a, a PR activity. It's no longer this sort of like, you know, black art of like, do we, okay, so we send out a bunch of emails or we talk to talent agencies and see who wants to play our game. And it is now being treated like a, 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 any other performance marketing channel where there is data uh, being used to determine who you work with, how much you pay them, how much of your budget should go into it, how to optimize, you know, okay, which creators are successful. We want to work with more ones like that. Uh, here's the ones that aren't. Okay, we got to work with fewer ones like that. Um, what creative we apply to each sort of activation, like all of that is is getting way, way, way more sophisticated. And I think when you can when you can stack up the companies that can go, hey, we spent this on influencer marketing. Here's why. Here's the tactics we used, and sort of here's what we're getting out of it. It stacks up next to search and social and paid CTV and like all these types of things. And I think once you're there, you're in the kind of run run place where it now is is a uh, a practice, not just a like I don't know experimental channel. Um, but I would say to say that's still probably like I said ten maybe fifteen percent of, of studios are that far. The meat is still in that walk that are kind of moving towards towards run. And I guess, yeah, game side definitely helps with uh, measuring a, a lot of that, uh, kind of helping a lot of the, yeah, the meat get into the 10 to 15% uh, range. So, <laughs> so that's good. Well, that's the, that's the hope. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny. It's kind of a funny thing. When we actually first started out building our influencer tooling, really, this is the way that came out is we, we had, we measured like, it was like the first hundred million dollars of marketing that ran through the platform. Uh, we, we, at kind of the end of the year, we stacked it all up, every single campaign, every single ad unit, and we're just trying to find trends. Like, what, what should we be building? What is working? What's not working? And what we found is of the top 100 ad units, like individual links, basically, of the top 100, like 90-some of them of the most effective from an ROI basis, 90-something of them were influencers. And we're like, huh, that's weird. You know, 90, 90% of the most effective channel or most effective ads were influencer ads. Like, wow, it's the most effective channel. What we then did is we kind of clicked out. If you take one, you know, one influencer and then say, okay, well, what campaign were they a part of? Then we went and looked at all those campaigns. And those campaigns were not all ROI positive. They were not all really successful uh, because the variance within that campaign was so high, right? You know, a game would launch, they would work with, let's say, 20 Twitch streamers. One of them, you know, in our top 100 was 
great investment, massively profitable, like, you know, 10 out of 10. You'd get maybe two or three others that were sort of ROI positive, good, um, you know, good to great. And then you'd get uh, the vast majority that were a bad investment, negative return, and then you get a few that were like a zero. Like, you know, I remember looking at one that was like $25,000, $30,000 campaign or $30,000 contract with one creator, you know, and it sold like six, six copies of, oh, a, wow. okay. of a game. And we're like, well, this is like really, <laughs> really bad. Um, so either way, like, you know, we saw all this and our conclusion was, well, that's because at, at, this was years ago. Uh, companies were not really using data to make those decisions. They were maybe going to a talent agent who said, hey, I represent you know X, XYZ streamer. Maybe X streamer was like a perfect fit. They were that one out of 20 that was amazing. And they go, I also represent you know, these 15 others and like, you know, give me a million dollars and you know, all 20 of them will stream your game. That happened and the results were the results. Um, so we, we built out you know, data pipelines to help make those decisions and, and, and let people be smarter about who they worked with and who they didn't and how much they should spend and optimizing the performance and what game targeting matters and all these sort of like more advanced uh, decision making frameworks that you know again like Facebook would have Facebook has all of their targeting tools all just in the dashboard easy to do but with content creators it's, it's a, a different set of data that you need to look at um, and so yeah not either way longer longer derail on on that yeah, kind of run pe- r- running piece <laughs> great I, I guess uh, we can maybe shift focus a little bit now to maybe the more distribution side uh, of things so there are many Many aspects here, you know, such as uh, self-publishing versus, you know, working with the publisher, Steam versus the Epic Game Store, uh, and many more. Uh, but I guess, yeah, maybe my first question is, um, you know, what matters most when it comes to maximizing distribution? So I, back to like what we talked about a little bit earlier, which is I think the type of game matters so much for you know, free to play versus versus premium and types of game genres. There, there are definitely different answers depending on that. So I I can't give the generic advice that will work for everyone. Um, I would say probably the thing that, the conversation I have seen the most where I think developers are, I guess, tend to be wrong when they they start out is the the thought that we should self-distribute, right? We we don't want to give up 25%, 30%, whatever the the, the number ends up being to a third-party platform for... Uh, for publishing, you know, we're spending our own marketing dollars to drive people to our game. We should send them to our website, not to Steam. Uh, we want to ha- own the relationship and like all perfectly logical things that make a ton of sense. Um, I think what, what we have seen is that very, very rarely is that the right decision from like a purely math perspective, right? From a uh, how much am I spending in marketing to how many players buy my game, download my game, play my game, etc the conversion rate drop off from steam to your own website or your own launcher is really massive and i think oftentimes there's this thought of like oh well you know we're really well known people will trust us and therefore like we shouldn't have a lower conversion rate many many massive publishers who've been in pc gaming for a very long time have tried this and you know very few have have had success i think some of them take that kind of like drop off hit for the long term investment of we want email addresses and we want to know our customers and, and we, we sort of want to be able to to have that relationship, which again makes perfect sense. But but from a I'm launching a game, where should it launch? Very, very, very rarely is self-distribution the the right answer. Uh, the the power of Steam is so great. The number of players that have it on their computer that trust Steam that like to download games through Steam uh, is so high. I think the the best ex- example I can give is a, a game game we worked with, uh, super popular game and around for a really long time was on PC console and on PC both on Steam and then they did self distribution. So the story is they implemented Game Site. You know they wanted to measure their 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 marketing performance across all these channels. They had a uh, all of their ads were pointed at a landing page that was like their their game's landing page and said, you know, come play our game, download today, which was through them, through their own distribution, or play on PlayStation. Um, that's really, I think, where the game was. I don't think it was on Xbox at the time. So it's like, you know, either go to, go to PlayStation to play on console or download from us. Nowhere did it say the game was available on Steam. So they, you know, they start working with us. They're running marketing budget. Uh, one day I get a call from the, the head of marketing who says, hey, like we're, we're, we're noticing what we think is like some bugs in, in game site reporting. It's telling us that like 20% of the, tra- the traffic from our ads is installing our game on Steam. But that's impossible because our website doesn't say that you can download the game on Steam. And, you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't work. 
of course, we mild investigation only to learn that, like, of course, that's not wrong. That is exactly what's happening. 20% of players that they were spending their paid media on were you know, either backing out, Googling it, game available on Steam, or they were launching Steam on their desktop and searching to see if the game was there. Uh, that, that Players were finding the game on Steam regardless of the fact that they weren't told the game was on Steam and, in fact, specifically told to download it somewhere else. Um, and that I think that that story often just helps me remember just how powerful that Steam distribution is, uh, even when you don't want it to be. Um, so, you know, it's funny, because they ended up changing their their tactics, and what they actually found was they were getting a better return when they were actually just sending players directly to Steam. Sure, it cost them money, you know, that they, they had to pay their percent to Steam, but the conversion rate increase was just so much higher on Steam than it was through their own um, portal. So, uh, yeah, long, long, long story short, they, you know, Steam is a really, really powerful tool. Yes, it is is expensive. I think almost always worth it. You know, maybe rare examples where it's where it's not. Great, yeah, uh, that's that's definitely a very interesting story and also kind of showcases some of the differences, uh, you know, challenges and differences between self-publishing and, you know, distribution via platforms like Steam or Epic Game Store. Um, but yeah, maybe now we can get into, you know, the specific game genres uh, themselves. Um, in, your, in your perspective, are there like certain PC game genres that are, you know, particularly ripe uh, for marketing driven growth and which are kind of the more red versus blue oceans over here. What, what are you kind of seeing uh, in the data? Yeah, I, I think I, I broadly put it into two buckets. One is call them mainstream genres that are massively competitive. So like, I don't know, first person shooter would be, you know, one of the biggest ones type of game basically everyone's heard of. There are massive players that, that dominate the, the market. And then there's, niche genres. And I think, you know, kind of knowing where you are is important because I think that the, the strategies and then the tactics end up being widely different. I think when you're in the hyper competitive genre, like your whole strategy is how do we steal players away from something that they're already doing, right? Like, you know, we're making a, you know, first person shooter in the, you know, that competes with Call of Duty. Well, your whole strategy is how do we get people to stop playing Call of Duty and start playing our game? And you know, there's a bunch of things that one would do to do that, but th that is a really specific, um, you know, thought around how, how you're going to go to market. And I think the other is, you know, niche. And niche doesn't necessarily mean small. Niche could be really big. I think the the, the niche that I'm probably most interested right now in is like Soulsborne games, where uh, maybe you know a year and a half ago when when Elden Ring launched, like. There were not there weren't fifty games like that on the market. In fact, most of the games on the market were old, years old. And so that game launched. It was huge, wildly successful. Basically, people who played those games played that game, and then they were able to to kind of expand that pie. That's great. What's been most interesting is like since then the number of games that have launched that have you know competed, if you will, in that niche have mostly all been successful. And I think part of it is they. They you're not stealing. When, so Liza P is probably the most recent example. I don't know, launched maybe a month ago. Uh, they've just sold over a million units. You know, it was really the first Western game launch from um, from from NeoWiz, and you know they didn't really have like a lot of like you know brand equity and credibility to launch a game like this, but they were massively successful doing it. I think you know a bunch of the the tactics we could probably talk about, but I think that you know strategically. They're not stealing players from Elden Ring, right? People bought Elden Ring, they played Elden Ring, they liked Elden Ring, and they were able to now launch a game that hit that same market and said, "Hey, if you like this game, you should you should try try our game." They, they weren't having to fight for that attention in the same way as, again, if you're competing with 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 Call of Duty. Uh, obviously, the risks and rewards are really different. The, you know, if you're able to build the biggest FPS in the world, like it's a much larger audience and a much larger game, and you know the the outcome could be much higher. But the the risk is obviously really different when you're you're building for a niche audience that that likes a certain type of game and is actively looking for new games like that. So I think the, you know the question for a game like like lies at P. So much of that is going to come down to like really early user reviews. Is do, do people is it a you know, is it a good game? Which is you know whatever some subjective measure, but hey, there's a new there's a new game kind of like Elden Ring and people seem to really like it. Like that kind of is all they really needed um, to get the momentum going and then, then it's kind of pushing the, the, the boulder, you know, down the hill at, at that point. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, I think of those two 
you know, red, red ocean versus blue ocean, I guess. Um, I don't know that I, maybe I guess I wouldn't use that cause I don't know that yeah. it souls like games are necessarily a, a blue ocean. Yeah. It's just like a, it's more like a lake, right? I don't know. It's like, you know, Hey, this is a lake that we can fish in because we know how big it is. Right. We know that there are fish that grow in this, that live in this lake. Perfect. <laughs> um, so I, I think that might be maybe a better <laughs> bo- body of water analogy if we're going to sort of st- stick with that one. So, um, yeah. And then I think, you know, when you get into the, you know, the tactical side of it, they're, they're also really different. Uh, you know, timing is, it's one of the, the toughest things about I think PC gaming is like timing is so important and it's so hard to do right you know I don't know how long they spent building Liza P probably three or four years you know it's a multi-year process I don't know that they knew exactly when Elden Ring was going to come out they knew exactly how popular it was going to be and they, they knew that you know kind of now is like a logical uh quiet time for souls like games where they're able to to sort of say hey we've got a game like this for people who loved Elden Ring but haven't played it in a while and are excited for a new one that worked out super, super well, but but timing is is really, really challenging. Uh, where I think when you're competing in those hyper competitive uh, game genres, oftentimes the, the timing comes down to like single digit weeks. Like I can remember, um, you know, a, a game that I spent a decent amount of time with is um, 1047 uh, Splitgate, which is an arena shooter, you know, sort of like a Halo competitor, free to play Halo competitor. And they, they were able to to sort of have this big launch moment on console in the time when people were really excited for a new Halo game, but the new Halo game was like a couple months away. And so the, the small team, small budget, certainly compared to, 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 to Microsoft, and they, they were able to, to have a lot of success by, by kind of timing that just right, where, you know, had they got it just wrong, and all of a sudden, you know, the, you know Halo did, a, did a, a beta, and then all of a sudden all the players want to play Halo because it's the game they played before. So the, the, the timing and how you, you strategically sort of compete in one of those Red Ocean markets is, is also, like, super, super critical. So I guess, yeah, up until now, like, most of the discussion has, uh, you know, uh, very much focused on the first bucket that you laid out, uh, you know, the goals and kind of in that context, uh, you know, kind of setting your contextual goals uh, well. Um, so it, I guess, yeah, we can kind of move on to the second bucket, you know, and uh, this would be more on the advertising channels uh, side of it. Um, maybe you could start with just telling us, what were kind of the key advertising channels uh, over, uh, or what are kind of the key advertising channels over 2023? Uh, and also, um, you know, why? Why were some of them uh, so important? So I, we are, the you know, GameSite publishes a yearly report on this, you know, like ad network effectiveness report, and it has a super detailed breakdown that comes out mm, in a month or so. So I would say that, you know, I can give high level thoughts, but those details will all be in a really great report soon. Um, I think, I think at a at a high level for PC, it's you know, Facebook and Google are are the biggest channels because they are the biggest channels in the world. They the specific ad units and you know channels within a channel are definitely going to be different than what probably mobile developers are are, are used to. Um, but they're still you know, you know Instagram, for example probably a smaller channel relative to on PC than it is on um, on mobile but doesn't mean it you know it's not a, not effective uh, then there the, so there's like those big big ones um, I think the next bucket would be more gaming native so like you know reddit well obviously reddit isn't a gaming channel specifically it, it is a very heavy you know, people spend a lot of time talking about games on reddit and in reddit communities so you have like reddit and twitch and in those types of of still big companies with with large audiences but but have like more gaming native stuff where you're really like advertising on on and around gaming content um, and then there's all sorts of uh, you know long tail maybe maybe is 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 a bit you know, diminishing, but like there's lots of gaming focused um, ad networks that are built specifically for P- for PC. Uh, so that's that's things like you know Fandom or IGN and GameSpot. Like you have all these websites or series of websites that cater to gamers that do you know tons of different ad units. Um, those those are all different kind of buckets, and they all require different strategies. Um, I think in the last year, TikTok has been the biggest growth channel in games marketing you know, it's like more dollars flowing there than anywhere like kind of net new uh some of that is is tiktok you know growth as a platform some of it is their growth as like a company and, and basically having better products that that make sense and more focus on gaming which has definitely been a big focus for them 
Uh, I think we've seen Twitter kind of go the opposite direction. Um, maybe that's true for everyone else, but it's definitely been been true in in gaming. Um, and then I think yeah, the, the, there are a few, few others like Reddit that also I would say have invested more in gaming. And I think that's something that has been, you know, from our vantage point as someone that integrates with all these companies and works with all these companies, when we see the the kind of investment in everything from like product and data and marketing and sales focused on PC gaming, like they all have more success. It's like maybe not a surprising thing, um, but that has happened. And, you know, maybe it's similar to the IDFA deprecation problem we had as well, where maybe their, you know, their mobile game stuff is drying up and they're like, oh, well, what else can we do? And then they focus more on PC, but the, the, they, companies like Reddit have made great strides from a like really like a product standpoint in in having better more attractive products for for pc games that work better and perform better and then they're gonna get more budgets and it goes great so uh th those would be some of the the kind of like you know network side of things and then you know the other other couple things that i would say that we've we've probably seen this year is you know, ctv continues to grow and i think it will you know grow even more next year i think it's both you know, kind of macro and micro trends, you know, macro, there's just more cord cutters, more people that, that watch stuff on connected TV, more of those connected TV companies are, are doing ad supported models, which means that you can advertise on them. And that is also just, you know, this is sort of macro trend. And then I think on micro, they're also investing more in games, investing more in like kind of ad products that work well for games you know for pc games one of the things one of the reasons i think they've been successful is so many of them have high fidelity trailers and assets right they spend lots and lots of money making some really beautiful 30 second trailer that you know is meant for either an award show you know they're announcing their game launch at the game awards or some of them they are for linear tv but you have these really really high fidelity assets and those can run on CTV pretty natively and feel good. Where uh, I think there's, you know, if you're watching, you know, you're watching a show on, you know, that ad supported Netflix, and all of a sudden you get like, you know, kind of a, a small mobile game match three ad, and like the formatting isn't quite right. You're like, oh, this doesn't like, this doesn't feel like a TV experience or whatever. And I think that stuff kind of breaks the immersion a little bit. Where when you get a trailer for a, you know, a new Destiny two. DLC, you're like, oh, wow, it feels like a you know TV commercial because it probably literally was one. So uh, that's another channel that I think that, that we've seen growing and both growing in, in sort of size and efficacy. And then maybe the, the last one uh, that, that I'll mention is just like short form content, uh, both TikTok uh, and YouTube shorts are probably the biggest, but almost every platform now is, is doing more with that, that kind of short form video. Uh, that one I would call much more of the macro trend. Like that's just people in the world are consuming more of that content and gaming is some percent of that content. And so games ads will be some percent of that content as well. Um, I wouldn't say there's anything more nuanced to it than that. Yep. Make, makes a little sense. Uh, maybe as a quick follow-up, do you, do you see anything being different in 2024? Um, we you know with with the uh, with kind of the efficacy or the uh, the ground that's been gained by uh, some of the channels working over 2023 yeah I, I think that most of those trends are new enough that i would expect them to roughly continue like i, I think C, you know ctv is going to continue to grow i think short form video is going to continue to grow um i think you know vtuber content is going to continue to grow like some of these things that are are like trends now or not i don't think they're at the end of the trend i think they're they're still at the beginning um, and then I think the the biggest, I don't know, I would say like more of a prediction where I don't know that I have good data to support it, but I think it's likely to happen is I think Facebook and Google are both, I think, losing some ground due to some of the, the sort of restrictions and the way they built their platforms to operate in a certain world. And that world has changed. They are really smart companies with lots of smart people and lots of great resources. I don't think they're like, oh, well, they're just going to you know fade into oblivion. I think that's like impossible. So um, I expect to see both of those companies have innovations in terms of in terms of products, uh, you know, potentially in terms of targeting. I think both of those companies are are doing a whole lot right now around measurement and aggregate measurement and in, in ways to prove their efficacy that maybe is just different than what people were used to in, in the sort of IDFA world. So um, I, yeah, I, I would expect to see, I don't know, bounce back feels a, a, a too strong of a statement because they're both, you know, still very successful companies. But I do think, you know, kind of 
in the day-to-day weeds of it, I think marketers have, you know, we've seen, you know, PC games, that they're not spending as much as they once were. The efficacy is not as high as it once was. I mean, it's bad, and I mean, they're not spending. But that that trend has been not positive, and I would expect it to go back to positive, um, you know, in the next couple of years. All right. Makes sense. So, yeah, maybe maybe speaking, uh, since we're speaking about trends, uh, we can look a little bit more into the crystal ball. Um I mean, you've talked about, you know, uh, trends on the advertising channel side of it, Facebook and Google, a little bit of uh, TikTok. But there are other topics like, you know, content creator programs, VTubers, maybe there there are more. So in terms of like kind of key marketing related trends in 2024, what what are you kind of keeping an eye on? Which one which one should we should we as an industry also kind of keep keep an eye on? And also, which one is kind of uh, that which which is the one that you're particularly excited about? Oh uh, yeah. Well, there's I think there's a there's a bunch. I would say probably my first thought would be creator programs, and that's something that you know is still I would say small and new. Not a, there's not a lot of companies that, that do it. I also think there's a lot of companies that maybe use that term incorrectly to mean something different than I guess what what I mean. Uh, but I, I would say the the idea that there is a long term relationship with a cohort of content creators that are advocates of your, you know, your, your game or, or games or, or brand is something that I think we're just going to see a lot more of. Uh, for, for a while, I, I would say that most of these sort of like creator programs were just companies trying to like basically get free media. Like, hey, like, you know, let's put up some, some program and we'll give people, you know, a free copy of our game and hope, you know, hope they, they stream it and then we'll, we'll kind of take credit for it. And well, you can obviously get people free copies of your game and maybe they will stream it. I think the idea that there's this longer term relationship, um, I think makes sense as the industry broadly shifts towards, you know, service-based games. Again, even if it's not a free to play game, most games now have some reason to, to have players thinking about talking about playing their game over longer periods of time, even if it's just like a DLC model. Um, so I think that, that, like sort of authentic creator program where there is value for content creators to sort of be part of this, this community of uh, in and around a game, I think makes um, not just makes a lot of sense. I think it makes a lot of like economic sense. I think it's, you know, they're, they're, they can be expensive to run. I mean, you're often talking about in-person events, you're talking about, you know, physical merchandise. Like you're talking about things that are not just like, Hey, let me send a, an email with a free key to someone. Um, but you know, as a company that calculates ROI, the the ROI on those uh, can be exceedingly high. And I would say, like, kind of the one simple stat that that we've looked to calculate the the value of a lot of these is when you when you look at how most games launch. You know, they they look like this, right? You know, the game launches, a lot of hype, and you know, then they then they go down, and that's that's both like number of people playing it every day, that's number of people streaming it, number of YouTube videos, like all of those stats for like kind of how relevant your game is. That's true for every game, right? They go up and they go down. Even successful games, that's what that's what happens. And what we see with with well run creator programs is that it it sort of like raises the floor so you know the big hump happens and then instead of crashing to the bottom it like kind of hits a much higher you know kind of homeostasis until the next you know the next launch the next dlc the next patch like whatever the thing is and so i think from a uh, you know an roi standpoint that can be wildly valuable but they're really hard to do and i think that's also like you know they're, they're still we're in the, we're probably in the crawl maybe moving towards walk phase of of creative programs as a marketing channel we're, we're really far from kind of that that run uh, so i think that's one that that I've seen work really well, um, you know, that I'm really excited about. Uh, the next, the next one is VTubers. I mean, I barely alluded to it, but I think VTubers are a, a, both both a growing channel. Like, there's there are more VTubers tomorrow than there were today by a lot, and the sort of efficacy, especially of the the, the larger ones, as they get bigger, they they have more influence and they have more impact, um, and you know, they sell more games, basically. So uh, that's something that that I, I see continuing to grow. I think both, you know, kind of like broader macro societal trends towards, I don't want to say tolerance, quite the right word, but like acceptance of AI generated and artificial, you know, looking characters. Like those are all things that I think 10 years ago, if you would have asked me like, yeah, that, I don't think people are going to be interested in watching a 
cartoon character stream a video game. I would have just been wrong. Like that's now uh, becoming more commonplace. I think those, as it gets more, becomes more commonplace, the the size uh, and impact of those you yep. know, those specific groups of creators will grow. So that's that's another one that uh, no doubt. And then the last one, uh, just briefly, uh, would is is that short form content we already already talked about. Like that that just does not seem to be slowing down. And I think that for a lot of developers who, who um, I talked to someone about this actually just I think it was yesterday, where as they're developing the game, they spent so much time thinking about how to make the game like streamable and watchable on Twitch for like an hour at a time, right? Like how do we have these fun, engaging matches that people want to sit and, and spectate for an hour? Great and important. And I think that was sort of like the goalpost they were shooting at. And I think there's this, this like new goalpost that's, well, how do you make a game that has funny or terrifying or whatever 10, 12, 15 second moments that people want to post on TikTok yeah, I, I mean the number one most of the best the best genre. If you if they were if, if this was the outcome, if you're like, hey Adam, let's make a game and let's make it huge on TikTok, the genre would be horror. the The games that perform the best in short form are horror content. People like watching other people freak out, for lack of a better term, and like ah, and like that is a that is the the moments that that work the best on short form videos. So those games perform the best you know does that mean you should just add like random shock horror elements to your moba probably not but um, i think you know, what is the other version of doing that for your game i think it's just a new is a new thought that you know if i were developing a game i'd be like you know how do we do this how do we have these these like moments really that, that people want to watch either get played and i think maybe the underappreciated pieces want to watch other people play and that's that like it's the reaction it's not the horror moment people don't watch the you know whatever the monster jump out of the closet that, that they don't care so much about they want to watch you watch some a monster jump out of the closet <laughs> and, and i think that's just a yep. uh, it's just a new enough phenomenon that i'm not sure we've all figured out what how, how to build games that, that are specifically tailored to that yeah nice yeah, I can um, I can definitely kind of uh, confirm uh, everything that he said because I'm one of those people who likes to watch other people getting scared on, you know, TikTok and such. Uh, during the horror moment itself, uh, you would definitely find me, you know, reducing the volume or maybe looking away from the screen. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I do enjoy the reaction to it. So, <laughs> yep, that's Interesting. so great. Yeah. <laughs> no, too, too scary for me. I, I avoid all yep, that scary so, stuff. I, I'm safe. <laughs> all right. Great. Um, yeah, that's that's like great. Some great insights into, you know, kind of the future in 2024. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, we're kind of running up on time. So, you know, a good time to also close up with the final question. Since this is a go to market, uh, you know, strategy insights uh, related podcast for PC games. If there's one game GTM strategy that you'd recommend everyone to study, you know, which one would it be and why? Uh, well, I, I will. I won't answer it perfectly because I'm going to say I, I don't. I think there there can't be just one because games are so different. So I, I guess I can give you okay. two. I can give you one that I think you know for a, a, a I'll call it premium game versus free to play because I just think that they're they're so different. So I, I think for premium, I think Lies of P that it's very recent, just launched, is pro- probably one that that I would you know, point people to as they they did a lot of things well. Um, some of the things that they they really focused on was they were really. They really focus on wish lists and basically the 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 hype before the game launch. Uh, they did that in a couple of ways. They did that uh, one through uh, access to the game early, right? Like they had you know beta beta weekend basically to to allow lots of people to play the game. But I think specifically content creators, you know, can we get a bunch of content creators to play this game in advance of it launching to show how good it was uh, and get people excited? In in the the call at the call to action on all of it was like go wish list the game. Um, that has a lot of really positive downstream impacts. The the wish listing, right? It, it, it is you know, the game is more likely to be featured on Steam when it launches. Uh, it's more likely to be at the top of people's feeds uh, once uh, you know, the the very very broad industry number is like ten percent of wish lists convert to sales within like, I can't remember if it's forty eight hours or or thirty six hours or something like that. But you know within the first day or two, you end up getting a huge number of those wish listers that like quickly buy the game, uh, which you need in order to have the game have momentum and, and all of those type of things. So uh, I think that, that really focusing on wish listing and getting people ready for the game especially for a game that didn't you know didn't come from bethesda where a lot of that stuff was already built in right like that came from a publisher that people in the west broadly have never heard of so that that was a a hugely important part and then definitely focusing on content creators i mean they were i think the number two game on twitch the day they launched i'm pretty sure that was like that was a ea 
the new soccer FC, game, yeah. the new FIFA mm-hmm. game was the softball FIFA FC. Thank you, EAFC. Like that, that also launched that day. So I think they were number two to that. But you know, that's <laughs> the biggest game in the world. Yep. So, so like, still an impressive number to, yep. to get the game in front of that many people. So I think the, that would be one that I would point to. And then you know, it's a, it's a studio that now is you know they were probably going to launch DLC. I don't know if they've announced they will or not, but that's the type of game that very likely there'll be DLC. There'll be future sort of installments. And they'll be able to like kind of reuse a lot of those tactics um, to, to make it more effective over time. So I think that's a that's definitely one. And then the second one, uh, maybe I'm 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 uh, you know sort of biased because it's probably my favorite game uh, would be Magic: The Gathering Arena. It's like the digital version of of Magic card game. And I think what what I would kind of give them the most credit for is like that the game launched five years ago. I think or maybe six years ago now. It's like it's not like it's a new game. Um, I happen to work with them when it launched so I, I can remember back then but i think what they've done as well as really anyone in pc is try new things measure new things get smarter about those things and so well i would say you know not everything they did when they went to market worked they figured out what didn't and what was gonna kind of work for them in a way that was you know i don't know um intellectually honest, right? And I think that can be really hard, especially at big companies where you have a lot of people with opinions and a lot of people with their own pet projects and like, you know, people invested in those things. And I think they've been really, really great at going, hey, this is what works for us and this is what doesn't. And I think the the best sign tactically of a game that, you know, marketing strategy is really successful is, you know, how often do you see ads for their game and their Five, six years after launch, I still see their ads everywhere because they, you know, they don't spend that money if it doesn't work. And so I think you can always tell you know, whose who's games were gained by how much they're still they're still marketing, and that's still a game that is you know widely widely marketed and and still growing. So uh, yeah, I think the the the, the, the tactics should be different between Liza P and, and Magic being a you know free to play versus a a PC game or sorry free to play versus a premium game, but both were really successful and I would definitely look at either of those if I was launching a free to player. Great. I think, I think that's a great place to end our discussion for today. Uh, for today. Uh, so thanks again, Adam, uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, it's really been a pleasure to have you on. Um, if listeners want to connect with you uh, or learn more about GameSight or even check out the the report, the advertising channels report, uh, I hope I'm getting the name right. Uh, that's dropping in a month. Um, you know, how, how can how can they do so? Where can they find you? Sure. So uh, I'm easiest to find either Twitter, uh, it's at Adam S. Lieb, or on LinkedIn. I'm sure my name is somewhere you can find, and you just find me on LinkedIn. I, you know, if you say that you listen to a podcast that I was on and you want to chat, I'm happy to, to take the connect. Uh, for the company, just go to the you know, go to the website, gamesite.io, and certainly have easy ways to get in touch with us there. Uh, the the Ad Network Report, which I actually think that Nicole is retitling, I think she's, okay. as you mentioned, really good at naming stuff, so I think yeah. she's coming up with some other name for it this year, so I, for, I don't know what it's going to be called. Uh, you know, that'll be That'll come out. It'll be in the it'll be in the press, and then you know eventually it'll be on our on our website uh, under reports. And it's it's free. It's always free. It's you know meant to be informative. So um, yeah, that'll be I think broadly available in the next month or so. All right, perfect. Sounds good. And to our listeners, uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, and we'll catch you in the next episode in a couple of weeks for some more insightful conversations. Until then, all the best with navigating your next PC game launch. If you enjoyed today's episode, whether on YouTube or your favorite podcast app, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, or give a five-star review. And if you want to reach out or provide feedback, shoot us a note at podcast at novic.co or find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Plus, if you want to learn more about what Novic has to offer, make sure to check out our website, www.novic.co. There, you can sign up for the number one games industry newsletter, Novic Digest, or contact us to learn about our wide-ranging consulting and advisory services. Again, that is www.novic.co. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.